we are feeling a resonance, a resonance in here with the music. Everything this morning is a song. Barbara just came up and sang that story, and I'm going to keep singing to you right now. I hope you can feel the resonance, resonance or whatever you're feeling, consider it part of the resonance of this energy that is rippling through this sanctuary this morning here at All Souls. I, I have a story too, uh, Barbara. I have a story I wanted to tell. It's a, it's, it's a little different, a little more of an adult story uh, in terms of it was, it's a true story from the autobiography of Billy Martin. Billy Martin, some know, famous Yankee. He was a, he was a, a second baseman for a long time on one of their, a couple of their championship teams, and then the manager for many years of the Yankees. Good friend with Mickey Mantle, one of the most famous baseball players of all time. And in his autobiography, Billy Martin tells a story of, of going on a hunting trip with Mickey Mantle. Mickey had a friend in Texas who had a ranch, and he would let Mickey and some other people hunt on his ranch. So these guys went to Texas, drove into the ranch. When they got there, Mickey got out of the car. He said, told Billy, wait here, I'll go talk to my friend, the rancher. He goes up and talks to his friend, who immediately says, absolutely, you guys can, can hunt, have a great day. He said, but can you do me one favor? He said, I have this mule in my barn. It's really old and is blind, and, and I just don't have a heart to put it out of its misery. Well, you're here. Can you, can you shoot it for me? And uh, Mickey said, sure, no problem. So then Mickey goes back to the car, and he, he, he slams the door. He scowls. He acts really upset. And, and Billy said, what's going on? He said, drive me over to the barn. He said, he said we can't hunt here. He said, I'm going to go kill one of his mules. And Billy's like, you can't do that. He said, you watch me. He gets out, takes his rifle, goes into the barn, and finds the mule, shoots the mule. And then Mickey hears two more gunshots. He turns, and he looks over, and he says to Billy, what are you doing? He said, man, we're going to show this son of a gun. I just killed two of his cows. Now, why am I telling you this terrible story? It's, it, it, it's not to say, uh, be careful with your practical jokes, although that's one lesson we could take from it. It's about the fact that anger is contagious, Anger is contagious. And right now, there is a lot of anger in our society. A lot of anger all around. So I want to talk about that anger. I want to talk about that anger um, at the ways in which it can fuel some good things because there's some righteous anger out there right now about some things that need to be changed. But also how that anger can mask important emotions and important things that we need to deal with for our own transformation and the transformation of society. So I want to talk about anger as a, as a signal or as a sign on the spiritual path. As we talk about embracing change this month, I want us to, to recognize anger as one of those signs through which we can go deeper in our own spiritual lives and, and deeper in our own emotional intelligence and other things like that. I mean, have you, have you noticed how contagious... We know how contagious... COVID-19 is, but this anger is contagious too. And there's a lot of it out there. People are, people, some, I think somebody, if I remember correctly, got shot at for asking someone to wear a mask in a store where masks are required. Um, if, you've, if you've watched or seen any of the dialogues going on on Facebook around political issues right now, even the campaign for president is starting to heat up with a lot of, I mean, some of the ads that are coming out. So we're seeing a lot of amplification of anger. And of course, our country is in the midst of a long overdue and really important conversation about race and reckoning with our racial history. And I can't think of another topic that brings up so much anger so quickly in people than the conversation around race. So anger is just in the air all the time. And I don't want to and I don't want to say anger is all bad because, as I said earlier, righteous anger can help fuel people to, to make a difference. I mean, there's a bumper sticker that you may have seen that says, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. And there's a lot of truth to that. You know, you see George Floyd 
being killed on the streets. If you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. So there's a room for outrage. It's how we channel it and what we do with it. Uh, if Brianna Taylor still waiting for justice for Brianna Taylor. And now, here in Tulsa, the city council is talking about painting over the letters of Black Lives Matter, which was painted on Greenwood during Juneteenth this year. I, it, it, I mean, that makes me so angry. It, it, in Greenwood in Tulsa, on, in the hundredth year centennial of the wor- one of the worst race massacres in the history of this country, and there on Greenwood, the people painted Black Lives Matter. What a better message for this moment in American history, and what a better message for the street of Greenwood right now. It's painting over it, what, a, what a, a, a crime that feels like it would be, and, and what a shame. But So I realize I'm really angry about it, and then, I, and then when I think about it, it's because I feel so sad about it. I feel so sad. That, 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 that that's the conversation we're in and that our city council may actually do that. And I know how hurt people are going to feel and how much unrest it's going to unleash in our community. And so what I realized, and psych- psychologists have realized this a long time ago, that anger is a secondary emotion. It's a signal emotion. It's, it's an emotion that comes after another emotion. So it's really my sadness, my despair, my, that, bef- that comes first around what's happening in Tulsa, what's happening in America, in these different places and different ways around the Black Lives protest that, that fuel my anger. Uh, John Lewis, who we, who we laid to rest, he said, uh, the, the, the late congressman, an he- American hero, said, when you see something that's not right, not fair, not just, you have to speak up. You have to say something. You have to do something. And so, so sometimes that anger just fuels and allows us, gives us the energy to get over the sadness, get over the, the, even the, the fear of, of taking on powers and principalities or what have you to be able to take something on. So I'm, I'm certainly not saying any word against righteous anger. In fact, <laughs> In the Bible, Jesus was angry quite a lot. You know, there's a lot of examples of Jesus being angry in the Bible, not just flipping over the money changers uh, who were in the temple, but he was angry at his disciples for falling asleep, for not understanding, for, for not having faith. So you see anger. There's a place for righteous anger, but anger also masks other emotions because it's, again, a secondary emotion. It's a signaling emotion. So I want to talk about, think about, think about, uh, a traffic, when you get cut off in traffic, right? You get mad. But the first emotion, if you really stop and think, that first emotion was fear when that, that, when that car all of a sudden came into your lane and it, you thought it could hit you, you thought it could cause an accident, might have hit, you know, you've got children on board, whatever's going on, harm your car. But at first it's fear and the sense of vulnerability and then it becomes anger. Um, same thing with um, uh, when you're insulted, somebody insults you, says something about you, belittles you, berates you, you know, it, there's, there's an initial feeling of, of maybe shock, uh, maybe feeling belittled, uh, feeling, feeling awful, feeling ashamed, whatever, but then we get angry at that person, and then all of a sudden we jump over those feelings, and now we've got our target, we've got our rage, we're now mad at them, and, and, and it sort of leaves that initial emotion behind. So I'm going to talk about that and, and the importance of that. And if you've, ever, if you've ever been fired from a job or lost a job or, or um, gone through a breakup that was not your choice, you know, there's a lot of sadness. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of, of a sense of, of not knowing, you know, what's going to happen next in your life that, that brings a lot of emotion But then it often will turn to anger pretty quickly, angry at the person, angry at the situation. What does that anger do? Uh, Psychologists have and brain scientists have have shown us that um, that it actually creates uh, anger, creates norepinephrine, which is which is an analgesic, which is a painkiller. So so that goes into your brain when we get angry and uh, epinephrine, which is a form of speed. It's an energizing. So anger is energizing and it, it soothes pain. So you, we can see how going from sadness, going from fear, going from these other difficult emotions quickly to anger helps to anesthetize those feelings and give us some energy to, to act, to move. And, and it's energizing so it can become addicting as well, like a drug. So, so why, 
Why now are, are, is there so much anger? I think in part because there's so much fear. There's such a sense of uncertainty about our economy, about this virus, about the political situation in our country. So with all of that, there, there, it's, people become angry and it gives them a sense of control. It gives them a target. It gives them, it gives them uh, energy and, and it gives them a way to express an emotion that's often more publicly acceptable and less scary than to express fear or vulnerability or some of the other things that many of us are feeling. You know, when we talk about the, the race conversation I brought up earlier, just how painful that conversation is for everybody. Uh, it, it makes sense why we get angry so quickly. You know, for, for white folks, for people who were ascribed whiteness uh, at birth a, in this country, it is, there's a lot of guilt often, shame. There's feelings of unworthiness, feelings of uh, just just anger, violation, all this kind of stuff that, that comes up from these conversations. So it's a lot easier. Instead of dealing with all that, I can just get angry at the person who brought it up or the way they brought it up or, or whoever wrote the article about it or whatever, and then that anger lets me skip over all that other stuff, at least for a period of time. And so we have to be careful that our anger isn't masking things that we do need to deal with and we do need to uncover. Um, I was thinking about the, you know, I'll give you an example from my own life, from my own situation right here at All Souls. You know, there's a way to tell the story of how I became the senior minister here, uh, 31 years old, one of the largest Unitarian Universalist churches in the country, uh, that, that make me sound pretty special, you know, exceptional even. And uh, of course, I, I, I love that story. Um, and, uh, and that's a story that I've told myself many times. Over here is a nice story, right? Um, especially if you're me. Um, but then, you know, so then if I'm in a conversation with someone and we're, and we're doing some analysis about race and power and, and they say, you know, keep in mind that being uh, male and being white and being straight and being cisgendered and being married and all of those things gave you uh, uh, a head up or a few heads up on, on other people in order to get a position like this. Well, that can make me really angry really fast. You know? and, and I think probably at times that it has in some of these kinds of conversations when I feel like some of what I've done is being discounted or my success is somehow being qualified. It, it's easy to, to go to anger and then to maybe shut down the conversation because of the anger or to just not deal with the, the, the larger structures and systems and other things that are also part of the reality. So I, just, I use that example just to say, just to hopefully illustrate how easy it is to go to anger in these conversations. When I think of, um, when I think of, of black Americans and, and the race conversation and just how much uh, folks are carrying the trauma, um, experiences of repression and violence and being discounted and being demeaned and things like that, it, no wonder it goes quickly to anger. And, and of course, understandably, it goes to anger quickly. And, and there's a righteous anger and there's a need sometimes just to get over all of those feelings in order to take action, in order to make a statement, in order to make a difference. So, so the anger has that role, that role, that righteous anger of fueling. But at the same time, we can't stay angry all the time. We can't stay in that place all the time. And so for the transformation to happen, it's about getting behind that anger, getting behind the mask and, and recognizing what else is going on. What's fueling this? How can I tend to the trauma? How can I tend to the, to the feelings that are underneath all of what I've experienced um, or even if it's been passed on to me if I haven't experienced it directly or that I've witnessed? Now, I think about the, the fabulous story that Barbara told a little while ago um, Ans, about An's anger. And it comes from a Buddhist uh, press, uh, from Thich Nhat Hanh's press, who is a Buddhist teacher from Vietnam, and in, in Buddhism, they talk about, like the story says, to sit with difficult emotions, to sit with our anger in this case, and to, to allow it, kind of have a conversation with it. Last week in my message, I talked about how Tara Brock, another Buddhist teacher, mentions 
making tea for Mara, Mara being the embodiment of a lot of obstacles that keep us from our own realization and enlightenment. And so when these things come, to sit with them, make a place, welcome them, find out what they're trying to tell us. So with anger, that's what I'm encouraging now as we're moving into this idea of embracing change. One of the important shifts that we have to make in terms of emotional intelligence, in terms of being able to to follow the spiritual path is oh here's anger what am i what do i need to do with this where what's the original signal for this what other emotions are behind this so while we're wearing our masks when we go outside let's take off the mask of anger and go deep and go beneath it and see what we can figure out now before i close i want to talk about how this is related to authoritarianism and autocracy and autocrats and and kind of the the larger political scene because why the question is why right now in history not just american history but around the world is there this sort of uh, appeal or attractiveness to sort of authoritarian figures and george will the columnist wrote a really interesting article about this in the Washington Post this weekend, where Will talks about the fact that um, people who are disturbed by complexity and intellectual pluralism and who have a yearning for homogeneity, uh, uh, sort of people who, who struggle with multiple perspectives and want to have just one story uh, are drawn to authoritarian figures who will put out, this is the story, this is the true story, the right story, the only story, all these other threats to that story are a threat to, to our society, to us, to, to, to those kinds of things. So think about it. People would like a single narrative of America, for example. You know, it was certainly a lot simpler when we could just say that, that America is it's the greatest country in the world where everybody has equal opportunity. The founders were these brilliant, brilliant men who were just exceptional beyond all, uh, beyond all you know, political history and all kinds of ways, and, and, and a Christian nation with the clarity around the right religion, and this sort of single story that, that, is, that is very comforting to a lot of people, especially in a time of uncertainty. But then when you have other people, multiple voices in a pluralistic society saying, well, that's not exactly my experience or the experience of my relatives, in, in this American story. So then you start introducing a kind of complexity like uh, that Thomas Jefferson wasn't just all great, the architect of freedom, and George Washington, you know, not just the, the great general who, who won the Revolutionary War, but they were slaveholders. So we've got to deal with that piece. Or General Lee wasn't just a great general, but he was also a traitor, right? And so when you start hearing these different perspectives, it can be very threatening. And so what Will was saying was on the right of the conservative uh, uh, political spectrum, you have a lot of people who are feeling a sense of cultural despair and a lot of threat due to this complexity of our m- more pluralistic society as more and more voices of people are being heard and people are being seen. It's very threatening. And so the complexity causes people to get angry and causes people to be drawn to authoritarian leaders who will even as Will says, be willing to take unconstitutional measures in order to protect, because that's how dangerous they feel it is, the threat to the society, the single narrative that, that is there. Now, I do want to balance that, as Will does, on the left, there's a mirror image of that, and it, it, it's in the, the far end of the cancel culture, which also has a trouble grappling with a certain level of complexity. There's, there's certainly a need to recognize what heroes, who do, we, who do we put on statues and who do we put in town squares, who do we elevate in our communities. That's obviously a really important conversation to be had and a, and a, and a reckoning and changes that need to be made. At the same time, there can be a lot, lack of willingness to deal with the complexity of some of these figures like Jefferson and others around the ways in which they have made really significant and important contributions to society at the same time that they've also had these other qualities. Um, so, so, there, so on both sides of the political spectrum, you see people wrestling with the, the inability to really hold the level of complexity that we need to hold in a pluralistic democracy like we have 
right now. So the work that we're doing to try to, uh, that, that I'm encouraging in, ta- in terms of anger and, and recognizing anger as an opportunity, as a spiritual sign for us to go deeper, to go behind the anger and find out what else is going on. That is something that we do for our own em- emotional growth for our own transformation and healing as well as for the healing of our nation. So that's my, that's my homework, if you will, uh, for, for all of us this month and this week for sure, because we'll take on different topics each week as we talk about this. But I want you, as you feel anger come up in you or notice anger in other people around you, I want you to not just stay right there at the surface but if not in the moment, afterward, to process where, what else is going on? What's the emotion underneath this that, that fueled this anger or fueled this other person's anger? I'll tell you, just in writing this message this week, I started thinking differently about you know, when anger comes up in, in my household with my wife or, or my children. If they're angry or I get angry, to, I, I've been forcing myself to say, Am I angry because I'm, I'm hurt by what they said? Am I angry because I feel powerless in this situation? Where's that anger coming from? And, and I'm trying to push myself, and that's what I'm going to do this week. I'm inviting you to join me, is to, instead of just getting angry at the situation, to, to be vulnerable and say, I, I, that really hurt what you said. Or, that really made me feel like I don't have a choice in this situation. That's a harder place to go than the anger, but I, I believe it's the place we need to go. And, and that love will guide us as we take this journey and embrace the changes that are around us. I will tell you that I miss you dearly, and I love you, and I hope that we'll be together again soon. And until then, let's hold on together, and let's continue this journey with one another. Amen. Inside us will lead the way on the road from greed to giving. Love will guide us through the hard night.